What is FAFO? That's a big question, but um, we have, of course, been horrified recently by learning that it means fuck around and find out. And uh, it's one of the Trump supporters' banners. So uh, uh, that is not the meaning of FAFO. FAFO used to mean uh, the research organization of the labor unions. We work with labor and welfare a lot. I don't need that one, do I? I only... Where is it? Like that? Yep. That worked, good. <laughs> so uh, today FAFO is just FAFO. We do welfare and labor research predominantly. And now it changed there, but not here. I need to follow the presentation here. Um, this morning speaker was, I, I can't see the presentation here, is that? If you do it full screen here too. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about this, but I'm, I'm doing kind of what they call academic karaoke. I tend to read my slides. That looks better. So, uh, what is uh, Tjenesten, or my, the services, and me? Uh, it's a lot research uh, project, a social science research project, that was granted uh, 12 million Norwegian crowns, which is considerable, six years ago, as part of an effort from the Norwegian Research Council to invest in ME research. F three other proposals were uh, in medicine, and one was supposed to be in social science, and we were very lucky to get that together with our partners at the Institute of Sintef. So the mandate for the study was to map user experiences with public health and welfare services and the interventions they encompassed. Also to learn more about the incidence, prevalence and prognosis of the ME patients, about the socio-demographic backgrounds of those that are affected. And for that, because we had generous budgets, we could use three different data methodology packages. First, we went ahead and ordered public register data, health register data, labor register data. Uh, it takes two, three years because of the person protection procedures, but we got a lot of very good data from public registers. Then we complemented uh, that data with a survey. Uh, I'm calling it an RDS and I'm going to tell you what this is about. Is this, is it working okay? Sometimes I have echoes. It's on and off. Uh, Let's try both. Um, finally, or actually initially, we started doing in-depth interviews in families where someone were affected by ME across the Norwegian country, followed that up with focus group interviews with the family members of the most severely ill patients who could not participate in other parts of the project. So what is the BPS model? Um, we actually think it makes a lot of sense that the way a person feels is a factor, it's, it's a product of, of how he is physically, how he is psychologically, and also how he is being met in the services in society. So we are suggesting an alternative BPS model, in fact, and the focus of our study is when these patients are meeting the public services, do they feel that they're being acknowledged? that they receive care, that the verdicts that are made in the public services are legitimate. Are they shown respect? And how does that translate into how they're being met in society? Are they met with acknowledgement there, with respect, compassion, understanding? We think that these two fields reflect each other. This illustration was made for us based on this principle by Cornelia, who is, has been recently severely ill by ME. She is recently out of Reusum Tune. Uh, and the illustration shows the ME patient all the physical symptoms and then someone tossing in extra burden in the form of non-recognition, 
institutionalized done care, the authorized imposition of illegitimate verdicts, and a general feeling of condescension. In a recent review, uh, CFSME patients under the National Public Work Program or Public Work Assessment Allowance Program, AAP, uh, concluded that the health and welfare systems lacked the knowledge about who would respond well to the various alternatives they had to offer ME patients. So the research question I will address here is how do the people who are affected with ME experience the most common interventions and services that are offered to them but also imposed on them during the diagnostic process and during this labour assessment allowance programme? and which is the period that leads towards a decision on whether or not they should get disability uh, pensions or not. Secondly, does it make sense to distinguish between groups of fatigue patients concerning the relevance of services and interventions? And in particular here, we wanted to compare the patients that met the Canadian consensus criteria for ME to those who only met the FACUDA criteria for the diagnosis. And importantly, we wanted to assess the separate impact of the PEM score on the experiences with services and interventions. For that, we used the survey data that we collected. A part of that survey was the DePaul Symptoms Questionnaire, the entire SF36, and we used algorithms, validated algorithms developed by Elena Jason and DePaul to address whether or not it's likely that a patient meets the Canadian consensus criteria or the CUDA criteria alone. Uh, I'm presenting today from a publication that came in April from Journal of Health Psychology. I have some copies with me that I don't want to carry back to Oslo, so please come to me afterwards if anyone wants a copy. Um, this is a little dull, but it is necessary to understand, to understand why we have done what we have done. We got a mandate from the Research Council, from their call, and that mandate told us to co focus on the Canadian consensus criteria. Now, we do have data on G93.3 in our registered data sample, but we also know that some people who don't meet the Canadian consensus criteria also get that diagnosis, and that some people who don't, um, uh, some people who do meet the criteria get the diagnosis very late. We also think there is a social dimension to who gets it early and who gets it late. So, how do we go about? We know diagnoses take time. Some never get diagnosed. And that leaves us with few available sampling frames for a survey. So, um, we have the draw from the patient register. We could even get a draw of respondents from the patient registers and, and send them surveys. Respondent rates to this type of approach is rapidly falling and we don't control the bias from that. We could do an open online survey. Um, we know that would attract bias from those who are most online active uh, in certain segments. Um, we could go through the patient association, but the way the debate has developed, uh, we wanted to try and find an alternative not to be accused for ideological biases or whatever is uh, the argument for that. So that means we have a target group without a clear sampling frame and that the available sampling frames have biases that we do not control. And we resort to a sampling method called respondent-driven sampling that is developed especially for populations without clear sampling frames. Uh, respondent-driven sampling uses network uh, recruitment. That means that one patient will recruit the next patient and so on. And that way we do reduce the free access of anyone who would like to respond. In addition to this, uh, it, we increase the response rates by people who wouldn't normally respond, but when encouraged by someone they know, will do it out of a social commitment to that person. RDS is a complicated algorithm-based mathematical system. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not very discretionary. Most, most of what is done in RDS is algorithm decided. What we can do with RDS is that we can monitor when the distribution of responses to certain key questions have stabilized in a way that it makes it meaningless to keep adding participants. I will show you an example on how that's done. 
It also enables us to monitor the clustering of certain features in patients. If some patients really only recruit people that are similar to themselves, uh, we will know. And the system will weigh down. They will use estimators to reduce the impact of the responses of people who uh, only recruit people who are similar to themselves. Also, we have ways to address whether or not a person is very likely to be recruited by mapping the social networks of that person. If you have a large social network in the target group, you will be, the estimators will give your answers less uh, weight. If we get to someone with very few recruitment probabilities, their um, answers will weigh the more. Again, not up to our discretionary power, this is done by the RDS system. So when we have this data, on fatigue patients, we cast a net wild. Um, we wanted fatigue patients who uh, were too sick to work or study full time. That's where we drew the line. And then we used the algorithms from uh, Jason and DePaul to try and make kind of a distant, um, distance uh, diagnostic uh, exercise where we have a fair idea of who meet the Canada criteria and who meet the Fukuda criteria and who meet neither. We know from these algorithms that the sensitivity is good and specificity is uh, moderate. That means that in the is is I get a lot of strange echo. How is the sound to you? It's fine. Okay, okay. Um, the first thing means that in the Canadian consensus group, we probably only get people with the Canadian consensus criteria. This has been measured by using these algorithms and then do clinical examination of the same persons and, and see how much how well they are matched. In the Fukuda group, we're more likely to have some uh, Canada consensus uh, criteria persons who have been erroneously excluded. And this is uh, the specificity problem. Not a big one. The ironical thing is that both of these things are good for us. We get a clean Canada group, and if that Canada group is statistically significantly different from the Fukuda group, and the Fukuda group is polluted by some Canadian consensus criteria patients, um, then the findings are actually even more robust. Uh, using these questionnaires also allowed us to focus on PEM. We could use standard scales for PEM based on the DSQ. And then we could use the results to tell us more about what patients had larger probability of benefiting from certain services or interventions. So the two main things here, we do meet the requirements of getting a sample with only Canada consensus criteria patients, which I don't think has been done before. And we have a sample that we have very good control over. We know exactly what has happened here. This is just an example of a recruitment tree in RDS. This is uh, colors showing which ones of the people recruited are members of the ME Association and not. So you see the first blue dot at the top is one person from the ME Association who has recruited four more persons from the ME Association. But then you will see it develops into recruitment. Also people who are not in the ME Association at third forward level, that's approximately 40% who are no longer a member of the ME Association. And then that distribution stabilizes for the next rounds. And that's fascinating. It keeps happening in RDS. Um, we uh, measure that by convergence plots. This is a convergent plot. It shows that for the first 100 participants, uh, the distribution on membership or not in the MS Association were quite erratic. But then after 200, 300 participants, it stabilizes. So for the last 400 participants, it's the same distribution. 40% are not, not members, 60% are members. What does that tell us? It tells us that if we add another 100, another 200, another 400, 500 participants, it's not likely to change very much. Now, this is an illustration of the race towards getting the ME diagnosis, the care you're entitled to, and your welfare rights. When we write academic articles, it looks more like this. You start going through the diagnostic process with your general practitioner, the primary healthcare services, the secondary healthcare services, the specialist healthcare services, private and public. And then they will try certain interventions. You will have to talk to a psychologist, a psychiatrist, meet a physiotherapist. Uh, you will normally be asked to try cognitive therapy. You'll be sent on rehabilitation, etc. 
we included some alternative uh, methods. And for three of them, we got sufficient amount of uh, responses to include them in the survey. That is gamma globulin, LDN, lightning process. And finally, we looked at uh, patient experiences with the welfare authorities work trial programs where the patients are placed in a work environment to see if they have remaining labor capability. In the article, there is a long, long table looking like this. And uh, if we just pick one of the lines, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, what this table shows are three different things. First, it shows the rate of patients who felt that a certain intervention was useful for them. The first column is the Canada patients, the second of Aguda patients, and you see 16% of the patients meeting the Canada consensus criteria said they felt that cognitive behavioral therapy had been useful for them. 54% of the patients who met only the Fukuda criteria felt so. The third column is a t-test, which is showing that that's quite robust. Then I'm showing the mean satisfaction rates. That goes from plus two to minus two. Plus two, they very much agree this was useful. Minus two, they very much disagree that was useful. And finally, you see the effect of the PEM score. And if you follow that right column, you see that PEM is decisive to the benefit of almost any service and intervention that we examined. The table is long. Now, this graph is the overall scores of the Canadian consensus criteria patients. How they did experience uh, the different services and interventions that we examined. And the overall picture is, of course, one of great dissatisfaction. Interesting, there has been talk about uh, gamma globulin and IVF, IV, I, IV, IV, or IV, I, F, I, yeah, I, yeah. Um, and this is actually what they are most satisfied with. They're also quite happy with the symptoms management training classes. Psychologists, LDN, it starts falling, and you see at the bottom that many are very unhappy with the cognitive therapy, the lightning process, but worst of all, these trial programs where they've been placed in, in, in work environments. We also wanted to know if they felt acknowledged by the services. So one thing is, okay, they, maybe these things are not really helping them, but do they feel that they're well met? And the results here are a little bit better. They more often feel that they're met uh, well, that they're being seen and understood by the providers of the services. But we also see that for cognitive therapy, the psychiatrists in hospitals and during the lightning process, they don't experience to be acknowledged to a very large extent. So how do the Canadian consensus criteria patients compare to those only meeting the Fukuda criteria? Well, quite systematically, well, the overall picture, the average uh, satisfaction score with most services, the common services, uh, is largely negative. Now here, here the Fukuda patients are gray and the Canadian consensus criteria patients are orange. And you generally will see that the Fukuda group is more uh, satisfied with the services than the Canada, Canada group. In three, four of these areas, the differences are statistically significant. When we look at to what extent they feel acknowledged by the service provider, it's a little bit better. So there are nice people out there, uh, good people meeting them, but what they are supplying them with this are, is, is really very useful for the patients. Summarizing this, um, Fewer than half of the expect, uh, affected experience the most common interventions as useful. And the worst out were the rehabilitation uh, programs, down to 20%, and cognitive therapy, which was down to 16%. For most of the interventions, the negative satisfaction score was negative. Sorry, the, the average score was negative. Uh, and the fact that 94% said that the labor trial program had made them sicker is really a serious concern. We see that the patients more often experience to be recognized than to benefit in their encounters with these interventions and service providers. But um, I think that at least for some of the services, there is 
quite some to be desired. The patient group that meets the Canadian consensus criteria has generally poorer experiences with these services and interventions than the group that only meets the FUCUDA criteria. So yes, it seems like there is a meaningful distinction between the two. So the difference, for example, in the proportion of the Canada and the FUCUDA patients who experienced benefit from cognitive behavioral therapy and rehabilitation was statistically significant, although the sample was not that large. When it comes to PEM, the degree of PEM seems to be very closely related to how these patients experience uh, services and also acknowledgement. And the effect of PEM on, in predicting how a service will work for a patient is statistically significant almost all through. So the way we see it, the degree of PEM appears as a possible indicator for whether a person affected by ME will benefit from a service or not. There are two implications to this. We repeat from what has been said before today, that when we see the negative average scores in benefits and interventions, we keep reminding ourselves that do no harm is the guiding principle of all help. And second, that the relatively low proportion of patients who are not seen and understood in services and intervention should remind us of the importance in, in my uh, alternative take on the BPS model, that being seen and understood is really important in creating those good synergies between the medical, the psychological and the social. We have a website with a lot of material and, and um, and uh, webinars and presentations we've made. On that website, you will also find a summary report with big letters, easy to read, of the different parts of the project. I have a few copies in paper here that, again, I don't intend to carry back to Oslo. Um, and then I have tossed in a couple of extra slides listening to the other speakers. Nigel brought up what we call people with ME, ME, or uh, CFS. And this has been one of the principles I have been testing with journals in this process. So uh, in, in the article I have here, I say that we use the term ME, not CFS, ME. By that, we refer to the guideline for academic publication, which is the American Psychologist Association's guidelines, APA, 7th edition. APA writes, which is really what academics are obliged to follow. The overall principle for using disability language to maintain the is to maintain the integrity, worth and dignity of all individuals as human beings. Language should be selected with the understanding that they expressed preference of people with disabilities regarding identification supersedes matters of style. If you are unsure of what approach to use, seek guidance from the nearest self-advocacy group. If you work with people, ask them. So that's what we did. In the survey, we asked, what labels do you identify with? And as you see, um, most people identified with ME, uh, very few down to the CFS ME, almost nobody with the CFS label alone. So this we tossed back to the editors of the journals and, and it's very difficult really to, uh, to argue with the APA style, uh, the APA guidelines. So they have approved us for that, but it's been a principle. Ask the nearest self-advocacy group, where is the CFS group? I couldn't find it. So that would have to be the ME Association. So I, I think this choice of language is not only um, an absolutely necessary sign of respect to the patients, but it's also in line with the writing guidelines that most academic journals are relating to. Diane said informed consent to treatment is never optional. One of the things we found uh, in during our work was that ME patients are, in their own words, forced to participate in medical studies on ME. This is done in different ways. We didn't ask about that. These are stories that came up voluntarily when we interviewed pay people. They had gone to an office, uh, their, their doctor, the, the welfare office. People would sit there with the recruitment forms for a study. Uh, one describes how they held the papers uh, up against their body, having them signed without having seen the informed uh, in the information chart. 
one explained uh, how she had felt obliged to go and participate in a study in fear of disappointing the welfare officer. And when arriving there, there was a camera and they wanted to film her. And she said, no, I haven't agreed to that. There was nothing about that in the informed consent form. Um, still, she was coerced to do that. One described how she kept trying to travel to all these encounters during this program, couldn't do it anymore, and was threatened by being taken off the uh, labor allowance uh, program. So um, I also debated uh, two members of the National Ethics Committees for Medicine uh, at Norwegian TV about this, um, because this way is uh, absolutely unacceptable in science. Voluntarily informed uh, consent in research participation, as well as in treatment, is not optional. So thank you. Uh, one more article that we wrote, I'm just referring to um, uh, early on in the process when we saw the, the drama in this field. Um, it's called, it's a research ethical responsibility to build uh, relations of confidence to users and research participants. We concluded that article by uh, quoting Canadian professor Simon de Cray, who once tweeted that he had never experienced more motivation and joy in his professional life than after getting involved with what he calls this awesome and dynamic community. We write that we share this experience. Uh, we have experienced this as very meaningful and a great privilege to do research in a research field where there's so large uh, knowledge gaps and where those concerned are actively very concerned with what we are doing and what we have done. So by that, I would like to thank the patients who have been supportive and critical and uh, really helped us tremendously throughout the entire research program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Scherland. Um, do we have any questions or comments right away? Otherwise, we will uh, gather the speakers for the panel discussion in just a minute. Nothing urgent, as it seems. Okay, so we'll <laughs> save the questions or comments for, for the panel uh, discussion. Just one comment about the lack of informed consent. Uh, I mean, uh, and not not for generalizing, so to say, but but in Norway to see that uh, that was really appalling. I must say. So. Yep. Yeah. Okay. And I, I heard even worse cases from Denmark recently, actually, that okay. that people are forced to uh, put their children in research programs, and if yes. not, they can take away their child benefits. Okay. That's not possible in, in no. Norway, but, but the way the public sector are intervening in recruitment to research studies, when they have this type, or they can even threaten with the child protection authorities, uh, the public sector should not be involved in re recruitment of research participants. It, it makes no sense. It's, it's very risky, yeah. yes. Okay. So thank you again and